In my experience, a lot of people may have fundamental issues with the agreement because they either don't think that climate change is happening at all, or that it is, but it's certainly not caused by any kind of human activity, or that scientists are just generally uncertain about the whole thing, so it's really a non-issue. A lot of people claim many different things in discussions of climate change, and I believe the science gets lost in social media and TV debates between presenters, skeptics, politicians, and invariably Bill Nye, so much so that unless you're an actual climate scientist, it becomes very difficult to sort out facts from alternative facts in all of this coverage across the media. So as a climate scientist and an educator, I want to discuss purely the science of climate change and the facts of the Paris Agreement, just as I would in my lecture hall, but without the exams. My opinion does not matter here, and actually neither does yours. There is no blind belief and no denial, only scientific research based on data analysis and peer review. First, I want to show you something from the last IPCC report. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and these reports are the definitive conclusions that can be drawn from the scientific evidence on climate change. I think that this set of figures published by the IPCC is one of the best graphical depictions of condensed scientific work that answers many of the questions people have about climate change. The top figure shows global temperatures by year. The black line is observations compiled from three independently produced data sets. And then there are two groupings of climate models. So this figure shows two really important things. Firstly, that observed global temperatures have increased by around 0.85 degrees Celsius relative to the year 1860. So that's basically the extent of climate change, 0.85 degrees Celsius of warming. And it shows that climate models can replicate that increase as they closely overlap with the black line. Now to the more contentious issue to explain how climate scientists know that humans have caused observed warming and quantify that human effect. And here is the proof. The second figure shows the same observational data and the same climate models, but this time all human influences have been removed. Things like greenhouse gas emissions and deforestation all gone. And now you see that with only the natural drivers of our climate remaining, things like solar output and volcanic eruptions, the models and observations don't line up anymore. There should only be a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 degrees Celsius increase, if anything, relative to 1860. Therefore, the vast majority of the observed warming has been caused by our activity. And in actuality, the last figure shows that if only greenhouse gas emissions are considered, then the planet should be even warmer than it currently is. But this is being offset by a slight cooling effect from a current dip in solar output and an increase in aerosol emissions that block some of the sun's rays. Okay, so climate change is happening and humans are causing it. But why the urgency, 0 0.85 degrees Celsius, doesn't seem like very much? I mean, why should we care about such a small amount? To answer that question, let's first look at this figure. The black line shows observations, and from it you can see that almost half a degree of warming has occurred in the 10 years from 2000 to 2010. That's a very rapid increase, so although we have only warmed 0 0.85 degrees Celsius since 1860, it has happened very quickly in the last couple of decades, and all models show that rapid increase continuing in the future as we globally emit more and more greenhouse gases. So it's been very rapid, but it's still a small change after all. But as shown here, small changes in the average temperature greatly affects the chance of extreme weather like heat waves. I always use the example of student grades. If I curve an exam by adding only a few points to every student's score, I can really increase the chance of receiving an A, A+, or even scoring over 100%. So with only small changes in global temperature, the likelihood of having extremely hot weather greatly increases. You could also think of it in terms of your own body. If your average body temperature warmed up by 0 0.85 degrees Celsius, you would have a fever and you'd be finding it really difficult to function normally. If we look at this figure again, we can see that only the low emission scenario, RCP 2.6, which represents significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, will keep the climate below 2 degrees Celsius of warming. All other scenarios, RCP 4.5, 6 and 8.5, which represent fewer reductions or business as usual, fail to keep the climate below 2 degrees Celsius of warming. That is important because it underlines the need for significant emission reduction in keeping our climate below the 2 degrees Celsius warming level. Warming of more than 2 degrees Celsius would result in a highly elevated risk of extreme weather events, cause increased and significant ice melt and more sea level rise, and threaten marine and terrestrial ecosystems and global food security.
Now, I just said a whole bunch of bad things that will happen if the planet continues to warm, particularly if we go beyond the 2 degrees Celsius warming point. Climate scientists have been criticised in the media for being alarmist about the impacts of climate change and described as being out of touch with the real problems facing people. Problems like education, healthcare, employment, terrorism, and for sure those are all hugely important issues that affect people every day. And if greenhouse gas emissions are to be reduced, it will certainly cost a lot of money. Money that could be used to improve other issues. Emissions reduction will affect the economy. But let's look at what the costs of doing nothing about climate change will be. Not in terms of the somewhat abstract impacts that are often bandied about, like ice melt and sea level rise and ocean acidification, ecosystem changes or even temperature increases. Let's talk about the economic impacts of climate change. So firstly, the change is happening very quickly and everything points to a continued rapid pace of change unless greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. And the more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more the warming and the larger the impacts. So logically, it makes sense to act sooner rather than later to reduce future economic costs. This figure has been produced by Munich Re, one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world, and it shows disaster loss events split up by type since 1980. It has been adjusted for population growth, inflation and increasing asset values. Now we should be seeing a decrease in loss due to improved hurricane forecasting and warnings, better building codes, better coastal defences, etc. But what it actually shows is upward trends in total events caused by extreme weather like storms, floods, droughts, heat waves and wildfires, amounting to a more than doubling of economic losses since 1980. How about these quotes? The Lancet publishes leading research on all aspects of health and medicine from around the world. They say that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, and they go on to say that climate change will affect most populations in the next decades and put the lives and well-being of billions of people at increased risk. General James Mattis, the US Secretary of Defense, says that the effects of a change in climate, such as increased maritime access to the Arctic, rising sea levels, desertification, among others, impact our security situation. Climate change is a challenge that requires a broader whole of government response. So we've got insurance, health and military all saying that climate change is a threat. Climate change starts to get pretty costly when all of these sectors cost more and of course, these extra costs are all related to climate change impacts such as reductions in agricultural output, sea level rise, ocean acidification, ecosystem changes and temperature increases. To bring it back to a more personal financial level, this research published in Nature found that if nothing is done about global climate change, then family incomes would drop by around 23%. They also concluded that if nothing is done about climate change, by 2099, more than 75% of the world's countries would be significantly worse off. For example, the US GDP would be 36% lower than in 2016. So let's get back to the Paris Agreement itself. The agreement was reached at the 21st Annual Meeting of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris on the 12th of December 2015. 197 nations came together and agreed to limit the global temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and also to strengthen the ability of countries to deal with the impacts of climate change. Why was this needed? Simply because climate change is a global issue and every country emits greenhouse gases. No single country, not even the US or China, the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters, can solve the problem by themselves. So now, let's talk about specific misconceptions about the agreement. The first misconception that many people have about the agreement is just that it's generally unfair. For example, people have said that the US must reduce emissions while others like China and India can increase their emissions. So let's look at the text of the agreement itself. Okay, so targets are nationally determined by each nation, not by any foreign power, and any nation can adjust its targets. These targets are public information, so let's go have a look at them. The nationally determined contributions are all available on the NDC registry website that is part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The world's largest greenhouse gas emitter is China, and it aims to reduce emissions by 60 to 65 percent and ramp up non fossil fuel energy production. It's already more than halfway towards its relatively ambitious goals. The second largest emitter is the US. Its pledge was 26 to 28 percent reduction, and it did not include a statement of non fossil fuel energy sources. 
it is almost halfway towards its goals. Third, the EU, more ambitious target of 40% reduction relative to 1990 when it was emitting more than in 2005, and it also did not define any energy policy, but it already generates 52% from non-fossil fuels. And it is more than halfway towards its goals. Fourth largest emitter is India, 30-35% to reductions and 40% of energy from non-fossil fuels. It is less than halfway there at the moment. In fact, all nations, not just the largest emitters, have made substantial commitments to reduce emissions as part of their NDCs. You will notice the reductions as a ratio of GDP in China's and India's targets because they are still developing and if we look at the emissions of greenhouse gases per capita, we see that they are nowhere close to developed nations. In fact, per member of its population, the US emits more than twice that of China and over 10 times that of India. But aren't China and India using more coal and building more coal power plants? That is incorrect. China has cancelled plans for 103 coal plants and India has closed down 37 coal mines. And guess what? The second largest solar power plant in the world is in China. And oh yeah, the largest solar plant in the world is in India. The next misconception is that the agreement will cost millions of US jobs. This is a difficult question to answer as we don't know what will happen to influence the future economy and impact on jobs. Everything from global and domestic markets to new technology and domestic and foreign policy can all affect job creation. Something we can do is look at what has already happened with jobs while the US has been fighting to reduce emissions during the last 10 years or so. What we can see is that since 2005, jobs have steadily increased with the only blip being after the recession of 2008. If we look specifically at the electric power generation sector, we can see that jobs in solar and wind technology are now more than double those in fossil fuels like natural gas and coal. In fact, the solar industry is seeing massive growth across all sectors, including manufacturing, installation and sales. This all points to existing strong growth of jobs in renewable technologies and energy generation that is far outweighing any losses from the fossil fuels industry. While switching to renewable energy sources are a big part of fighting climate change, it is also important to increase energy efficiency. 2.2 million US workers are currently employed in energy efficiency across multiple sectors, and the overall growth is strong at an expected 9%. So the US may see many job losses in the fossil fuel industry as it tries to reduce emissions, but renewable energy and energy efficiency industries look set to more than compensate. The next misconception about the agreement is that it will cost the US economy trillions of dollars. This statement is partly true. The US economy will be impacted by reducing emissions. There is no getting around that. However, we have already seen that the US economy has grown over the past 10 years despite reducing emissions by around 12%. But to answer this question fully, let's first go back to this research study that found that the US GDP would shrink by 36% by the year 2099 if nothing was done to reduce global emissions and counteract climate change. So, by the year 2099, the cost of doing nothing to the US economy would be $6.65 trillion in present day money. That number is twice what President Trump cited as the cost of the Paris Agreement, albeit by 2040. But ultimately, the cost to the US economy of implementing emission reductions will depend entirely on how it goes about making those reductions. Let's take a look at these tables from the same report that President Trump and others have referred to when claiming that there will be huge impacts on the economy. The report actually shows the difference in economic impact depending on how the US goes about reducing emissions, whether it's something like Scenario 1 with broad sectoral caps cited by President Trump, or Scenario 5 with economy-wide trading. Scenario 5 is smarter because it allows the costs to be absorbed by the electric sector, where reductions can be achieved more easily by switching to renewable generation sources like solar. Scenario 5 ends up costing a third of Scenario 1. The report also emphasizes that the economy still grows under either scenario, but obviously by much more under scenario 5. The next misconception is that the agreement will intrude on US sovereignty and make the US legally liable. These are huge concerns for any nation that is part of the agreement. So, they have both been specifically addressed in the text of the agreement. We discussed earlier that each nation defines their own contributions or targets and can adjust them at any time, so there's no impingement on sovereignty there, as each nation determines what they alone want to do. 
The concern regarding possible legal liability arises from Article 8 of the agreement, which could be interpreted as if a nation contributes to global emissions, it is liable for the global damage. However, this additional text states clearly that Article 8 does not provide any basis for liability or compensation. You see, many developed nations were concerned about being held liable for their contribution to the impacts of climate change, so this text was specifically added to address those concerns. Another common misconception is that the US will pay billions into a mystery fund and other countries will benefit. Under the Paris Agreement, developed nations are required to contribute money to the Green Climate Fund to assist developing countries with mitigation and adaptation to climate change. However, the amount given is up to each nation. These are the contributions so far with what's been pledged and actually given in the green columns and the per capita contribution in the red column. So yes, the US has pledged and given more than any other country on the list, but many developed nations have given billions to the fund and most of those are contributing on a higher per capita basis than the US. The US is in fact 11th in terms of its per capita contributions to the fund. In terms of it being a mystery fund, the Green Climate Fund website details how the money is distributed and showcases the projects funded so far. The last misconception that I want to discuss is that the agreement will only lower temperatures by two tenths of one degree Celsius. So why bother over this tiny, tiny amount? First of all, it must be said that 0.2 degrees is not a tiny amount considering all human-caused climate change since 1850 has been less than one degree. But the 0.2 degree number is also wrong as it came from this 2015 study by MIT that did not include all of the NDCs now pledged and assumed no strengthening of reductions beyond 2030. The most recent MIT study found that the Paris Agreement will reduce global temperatures somewhere between 0.63 and 1.07 degrees. So essentially the agreement will wipe out the climate change of the last 150 years. However, global emissions are still increasing at a fast pace so this would not be enough to keep warming under 2 degrees by 2100. The MIT scientists acknowledge that while the Paris Agreement is a good first step in the right direction, more reductions will be required. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, the Paris Agreement is not perfect by any means, but it is the first time the entire world has come together to agree on reducing emissions to combat the huge threat of climate change. It is truly unfortunate that any nation would withdraw from the agreement, especially one as looked up to or as big an emitter as the United States. The US decision to exit is not supported by the facts and it's not grounded in science. Its departure just makes it that much harder for the world to fight climate change.